Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Tom Stewart here. Got my partner, Liz Trotter. Hello, Liz. Hey. Hey, and we got our special guest, our friend Matt Ricketts from Better Life Maids, St. Louis, Missouri. Hey, Matt. Hey, thanks, guys. Hey, man, appreciate you being here because we've got some uh, some pretty cool, some pretty exciting things to talk about today. Uh, the news came out last night that the Senate uh, signed off and passed the uh, PPP legislation coming out of uh, the House. Uh, didn't really even have to send it back to the House. It's on the way uh, to the White House to be signed. Uh, don't know if it's actually been signed yet or not, but I don't think that there's any concern that it's not going to become law here within the next day or so. Yeah, it would have it, it had to take like an act of God for a bill directly written from the House to be passed in the Senate. That's the probably the only time we're going to ever see this like in our lifetime that the Senate doesn't touch a bill uh, that comes from the House because usually they're keen to put their own stamp on it. So I was surprised by that. That was uh, that was unique. So it's going to be in the Ripley's Food or Not book this year, right? They just they just realized the time was running out. I just think that they realized yeah. that the clock was running. There's just so much other stuff going on right now that that anything that they did was probably not going to be a significant improvement. So the PPP loan was designed to give us give small business basically eight weeks worth of funds to operate through through this uh, disaster i guess through, through this this whole whole deal now you're given an extra 16 weeks so you know we were talking you know, before we got on that at this point you uh, we, we would almost have to try to mess this up not to spend these monies in a way where they can't be forgiven yeah. Even even if we haven't spent some of those monies correctly so far, basically we can just start over because money is fungible. You can, if if you got if you had a hundred thousand dollars worth of PPP fund, just pretend you're starting over. Worst case scenario, most of us I don't think would have to do that to get whatever you know ratios of of you know people's you know pay and the numbers and so on and so forth. It, it's. We should all, we should all have 100 percent of this forgiven by the time we get done with it. Yeah, and I, I just, I always want to remind people is that even though you spent it all, it still may not all be forgivable. So you may need to actually spend some more of your own money and put it back in the pot anyway. Um, specifically, taxes, federal taxes, where you know, where every week you're you're taking, you know, basically two slices. Probably three quarters of that money is forgivable, and a quarter is not. So imagine at the end, you know, I'll just use my numbers because I know them and I've done the math on it, is we had about 261 to start with. Well, we're going to have spent 32000 over the eight-week period on, on federal taxes that are unforgivable. And you talk about fungible, I'm just going to basically refund that 30. I'm going to basically go through line by line, figure out what, I, what I've spent, put it back into my PPP bank account and notate it that it was tax funds. And that gives me another payroll and a half to run with. And then I'm going to keep doing that as I spend the taxes until we basically zero, uh, zero it out. That there's nothing left that I don't have enough to run a payroll with. And then I can use it to pay um, rent for a couple more months or some other smaller, some other smaller things. So uh, just remember that, like like Tom was saying, that it's fungible. But you do need to be aware that that the tax portion of every payroll is not forgiven according to the original rules. I have not read what they're doing with this new bill, but I didn't hear anything new about that. So I'm gonna assume that the that the federal taxes are still not forgivable. So you have to think about that and how you structure your, your payrolls. Did you check that out, Tom? Did I have not. I have, I've I have been checking just before I got on and I haven't been able to find anything with a lot of uh, a lot of the details yet. And it's I mean, this is almost so it's supposed to be signed by Trump and he's going to sign it. But uh, I mean, it's filibuster proof. I mean, it had 417 to one in the uh, in the House and, and it passed by a voice vote in the Senate, which means that it had to have at least all but one senator supporting. it. I think they're probably going to have unanimous unanimous Senate approval. So I, I don't know the exact number on that, but. Usually, a voice vote indicates that it's a pretty high approval um, rating or a pretty high approval, so a percentage. So I, I don't know uh, that it's even possible that it could could not be put into law at this point. 
So let's think about this for a minute. What would be the things that might happen or that we might not do that would cause us not to, to have all these funds forgiven? I guess we still have to get back to full employment, right? Yeah, I think what we don't know is is if there's going to be an extend, extension of these look back periods or how those are going to change. I mean, we've all basically been under the impression that we were going to try and keep our employment up to pre-COVID levels up to June 30th. But, you know, we were talking before this was was started and and I'm I'm labor constrained at this point. Like so I have um, 29 techs cleaning um, and then another new hire uh, starting tomorrow. So 30 plus three on leave, uh, 33. I started with probably 39 before this started, but some of those dwindled off for their own reasons and things like that. Um, I mean, we're, we're working hard to hire. I know your whole last segment yesterday was, uh, was, was hiring and you're going to do more on hiring on Monday. Um, but I, I think we're all probably going to be in a position, at least for the, the meantime, that people want our services back, that, that uh, we're in a good position. Um, the risk factors are, you know, shown to be lower and lower. I want to just a brief thing that I, you know, do you, there were two big news stories that came out of Missouri. Missouri had the Lake of the Ozarks, um, big parties over Memorial Day weekend. Were you there? I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I know you loaded up the uh, family trucks and you went somewhere. Had we went, to, we went camping. A, driver, you know, a paper clip and a bottle cap to fix something. <laughs> yeah, we, we, took the, we took the RV out and went camping, but uh, did not go to a big pool party at Lake of the Ozarks. Lake of the Ozarks is um, a little little wild of a place. So it's uh, everywhere has their own little redneck r- Riviera, like big party spot where everyone has big boats and you know, shows off, oh, yeah. you know, you know, whatever, every, every place has that, but um, it, not my, not my place. We, it's, it's gotten a little wild over the years, but the, um, but anyway, so, so they had one person that was infected. They went to all these bars and um, anyway, they've done contact tracing. There's been no new cases from that yet. So maybe pool water is safe. That might be, that might, I mean, there's no knowing, but it's amazing that no other infections came from, uh, they've got, they've done contact tracing. There have been no cluster outbreaks from that. Then there was the two hairdressers or, or st- stylists, I think would probably be the better term, uh, from Great Clips in Springfield, Missouri, which um, they they served about 160, about 80 customers each over a week period or something like that, where they were both infected and did not infect a single person. They were wearing masks. The customers were wearing masks. Um, so, I mean, I'm not sure what to think of both of those things, whether, um, you know, the masks helped or the pool water helped or what happened here, but we kind of dodged the bullet with, with some of those, with some mass infections. And so it, it's giving people, I think a little bit more confidence that some of the measures that we're taking are working. We're not seeing any big major outbreaks, um, related to some of these normal getting back to life activities, which, you know, I, I don't know. What's that? What's that? there, Matt, is um, is that a contributory factor at all? I mean, they're saying that in the summer, they're expecting, you know, everything to die down. Is it hot there? It's it's warm here. I mean, it's, you know, it's 90 degrees in the afternoon, you know, most days here. It's, it's St. Louis. St. Louis is awful. You know, it's cold in the winter, hot in the summer, no, no beaches, anything like that. We've got some rivers and lakes, but um, all my other St. Louis friends will agree that most of us try and leave here in the summer. So um, anyway, the yeah, we've been we we've we've seen a decline in cases, and um, you know I think that's leading to some confidence in the economy. And people are wanting our services back, back to the original topic, hiring and things like that. Um, I'm seeing we're hiring people in July first, being a number we're seeing here, and it's going to be different wherever you're at. But childcare is be is beyond an issue at this point. So we are, um, so a lot of these childcare places are opening back up in tiers in, in the St. Louis region or in the Midwest. And July 1st is kind of a line where we're seeing, um, one of my managers is only available in the office a couple of days a week and she's having to work from home with her, with her son um, because of childcare, but she has childcare July 1st. Um, I have a couple other people on the board that uh, are coming back on the 15th and then, and then a bunch of new hires that we're seeing are July 1st constrained uh, due to childcare, so that's going to be a big that's going to be a big bottleneck for getting um, you know men and women back in the workforce. But that's going to prop that's probably going to primarily 
um, be burdened by women. I, I don't know that the statistics on that, but I would guess that's the case. And, and I would guess that a lot of our workforces are women. Mine, I think I have two males out of uh, the 30 or so on my board. So we, we primarily have females. I think that's fairly common. We do too, primarily yeah. female. So our, our ratio is a little bit higher than yours, Matt, but definitely more more females than males. Yeah, we're usually about 20%. We lost two of them at the beginning of COVID. So usually around, well, I guess that still would only be about 10%, um, you know, for normally closer to 40 techs. So yeah, maybe about, maybe we usually have 10% of our staff being being male, but, and, you know, at any given time. But I think that's going to be a big bottleneck in in staffing and um, getting getting good people back. Um, I am seeing an uptick in applications. I know Tom's saying that it's less applications, but higher quality. We're starting to see an uptick. And um, uh, I think people are starting to recognize that, that that the clock is ticking on this extra unemployment. I'm hopeful that that's at least what they're thinking out in the future. We're actually getting a lot of, of initial interest, Not, but it's, it, they really aren't engaging in the process. You kind of get the feeling that they're trying to just meet the minimum requirements to keep their unemployment going. Okay. But the ones who you can truly engage with are really looking for work. I mean, they're 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 they're, they're strong candidates, and you know they're we're really happy with the people we're hiring. We just can't hire enough of them right now. Yeah, we were we were talking. When we were starting that that labor is the big bottleneck for us. Like, you know, we're, we're back up to maybe 70% of pre COVID revenue every day. Um, maybe we could be up to 80 or 90%. If I had a few more people We're you know, in a, in a normal month, we do about 70 initial cleanings and we can only schedule like five right now. So we're, we're, you know, 75% off our initial cleanings. Uh, right now, just so we're not able to like even really get geared back up for the clients we're losing or have lost because we just we're, we're constrained. We're just trying to take care of who we have and a few one times. Here and there. Yeah, Lisa is saying the same thing. Lots of apps and surprisingly some good applicants. So, you know, maybe maybe the tide's going to turn a little bit and we're going to we're, we're getting some good applicants. Maybe we're just going to get more of them which would yeah. be really really awesome i did the uh, okay so tom here's a chance for you to throw it in here's your chance right now because this really is, is an unprecedented event i want to apologize to everyone that's here because because we failed yesterday <laughs> to get the word unprecedented in the discussion we threw it in the chat afterwards but um i'm still still feel bad about that yeah but, but it, it, it is an unprecedented time for hiring as well what we're seeing we just we don't know right what we're seeing is uh, is this what it is today is this what we're going to see in a week is it everybody's seeing different things how do we how are we hiring in this new environment you, I, I, different I, I can't imagine us not being in a really strong place here in a couple of months once the federal unemployment funds go away and there's talk about bonuses for people who are unemployed who then get a job creating more incentive for people to go back to work Cut off. there's a lot of jobs that aren't going to come back almost anybody who studies this stuff is saying that we're going to be in double digit employment going into next year and unemployment, it's going to be years and years before unemployment gets back down as low as it was prior yeah. to COVID. i'm struggling i'm struggling with like the enthusiasm that is in the marketplace right now but what i think what really the truth is i think we're going to get back to a 90 percent kind of economy um, there's going to be some winners and losers in this kind of, I, I kind of call it the 90% economy. I think, I think we were at like the 50% or 60% economy there when things were shut down, we were down to like the bare essentials, you know, manufacturing and, you know, you know, some other things, um, we're, we're even kind of slowed down. Maybe, maybe we're below 50%, but I think we'll get back to 90% where I think we're going to see a big decline is the hospitality space, um, travel, tourism are all going to be down. Um, although, you know, with the RV, you joked about that. I can't get a spot hardly anywhere. Anyone that has an RV is booking out their summer and there is a ton of RV sales because everyone's like, well, I don't want to go to a hotel. Um, my friend that's an RV salesman is like, I've sold more expensive units, like 
250 to half a million dollar, like super nice RVs. Cause I've never sold this many super units before. Like where it's like, you know, like they might sell like five of those a summer. They've already sold like five of those in May. They sold their whole inventory of like their, wow. big, their big ticket, like, you know, units, um, like right at, right at the beginning of the year. So there's some enthusiasm for the economy. Um, but there's, but I think, like I said, there's that 10% that are going to be left out and they're going to be looking at new careers. Well, when you're talking about economic growth in like GDP, yeah, it might be 10%, might be more, might be, be less in terms of, of the diminution of value. But you're right. It's hospitality. It's food service. It's travel. It's retail. It's those it, those segments of the market are the same segments that hire the same people that we hire. So good news for us from a from a labor standpoint. Yeah, I feel like I feel like we're going to start to really benefit in the in the when this six hundred dollars unemployment goes up, or when the PPP funds start dwindling and companies start having to make some tough calls. I mean, I have a lot of friends. In the, there you go. Bring the dog out. Well, she was like, yeah. I don't know what was going on. I, I know Leslie's happy right now. She's on. She's like, finally yeah. brought Molly. Back. <laughs> I, I know, uh, right? I was, I've, I've mentioned my friend Chip before, and he's in the he's in the entertainment space. He has a lot like light and sound, and he has a big you know big company. They you know have maybe a hundred employees, and they do like you know big stage productions with light and sound and things like that. He doesn't believe he's going to be back in business until 2021. So that's, you know, what's that whole industry look like? I mean, how many people are just going to say, you know, I can't afford to continue to do this and what's comeback mean? I mean, no, come back at 20%, 30%, 50%. Yeah. I mean, he owns a lot of other businesses that he can probably subsidize some of this, but yeah, I mean, he's got like a lot of the equipment and things are leveraged. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know, but I think those manufacturers are going to have to just take that on the nose too. I mean, they're just, there's some of that is going to be, you know, passed on. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't see live events coming back for a while. I think like going to like the baseball games, you know, a lot of those employees are great people. Like the guys that work, you know, work at the baseball game, that, that like do that job year in and year out. I mean, they're enthusiastic. They're like great customer service. They're good at sales. It's a good, that's a great, I mean, the guys that are like the vendors of the games, those are, those would potentially be great employees. I mean, um, you know, I don't know. I think there's a ton of good people that are going to be on the sidelines when the PPP money runs out. We always talk about the unemployment, but what we're not talking about is the PPP funds is artificially propping up um, the unemployment numbers temporarily as well. We're going to see another spike in unemployment over the next two to six weeks as uh, the first round of, of PPP money dwindles and then maybe another spike after that is the second spot the second i don't know about the second group the the average ppp loan in the secondary group was under fifty thousand dollars so those might be small businesses that are just weathering this who knows what's going to happen with 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 those um but i would i would argue when the ppp money runs out we're going to see big changes all right so matt i have a question what is your opinion on so we're talking a lot about you know, um, supply and how we're going to be able to um, uh, work. Well, what do you see in terms of demand? Uh, do you think that we're going to have the same numbers of people? I mean, there's a lot of people out of work. Are they going to be some of the people that would typically, you know, have house cleaning? How, how's that playing out? What do you think? If I had to look at my main numbers, I would say, God, it's going to be a bloodbath. But I mean, it's come back so strong already in just this first week of June. It's like a month. Like there was like a line in the sand, like May and then like June 1st hit. And like everyone's like forgot about it. Like, it's like this is over. We're done. We're moving on. Like June 1st hit. We're moving on. Um, and how much of that has to do with, I mean, I, I'm not going political here. So don't anybody jump on me, Okay. But I'm just wondering how much of that, wow, COVID's over thing is directly related to, you know, the unrest that we're seeing. Is that going to, when that kind of mellows out or settles down, don't get mad at me if I'm using wrong verbiage, y'all. But as that starts to um, shift, do you think that we're going to see a, a, a shift in concern about COVID again? Or what, what are you guys thinking? 
I don't know for sure. What I do know is I, we've been through this in St. Louis for years. Like we, we, you know, we had um, six years ago, we had the Michael Brown unrest. Um, then there was a police officer, uh, Stockley, who uh, was uh, was let off on, on murder charges for something similar. And we had civil unrest for quite a while in St. Louis. Um, this isn't the first time we've seen this here. And it's honestly not undeserved in, in our region. So um, we've seen it quite a bit. We've seen some change in progress here, um, you know, over the last six oh. years. Um, but Gosh, it, I love hearing that, Matt. It definitely hurts. It definitely hurts the economy whenever it does happen, though. People, um, you know, we're, we're nine o'clock curfew here in St. Louis right now. <laughs> like every night, like you got to be in your door by nine o'clock. You can't be hanging out at the park or, you know, I live right across from the park. They don't even want us on like our porches or anything at night. And, um, you know, last night there were some caravans that were driving through and um, I, I think that they were probably up to no good criminal activity like they were like and from what I read in some police reports afterwards, it, not exactly related to this. But again, um, all of this stuff, it creates it creates uncertainty, which definitely I would think would hurt sales. You know, uncertainty in the marketplace, I think, um, usually hurt sales. But yeah. I'm not seeing it right now. It's not happening. So maybe the after effects of the COVID or people are just, they're, they're fatigued of, of all of the, of everything. So they're just yeah. ready to get back a little bit. Most of the, most of the medical minds seem to, to, to consent or, or, or agree that there's going to be an uptick in the, in the fall. And the more cases there are through the summer, like when this thing started, in like New York and in and, and, and Washington, the initial cases receded from people coming in either from Europe in New York's case or 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 Asia out on the West Coast. We're going to be self seeded going into the fall because there's already going to be people with with the virus that are going to be floating around. Um, to what degree I, I I don't know. From an economy going into this, I was really afraid that it was going to look like ten years ago where. You know, we lost a lot of business just because people couldn't afford us anymore. They were losing jobs. But this time around, because of technology, because a lot of people are working from home, you know, you know right or wrong, I guess it's, it's, it's really unfortunate in a lot of regards, but most of the people who are losing their jobs are in the service sector. And for the most part, they don't represent our client base anyway. Most of our client base are still have jobs and they're still, you know, making money. So I think that we'll be fighting COVID more in the fall than we will be people not being able to afford us. Not to say there's not going to be a lot of people still looking for work and, and having economic problems, but I don't think that they're going to be part of our, our market demographic to a large extent. You know, Ernie's bringing up a, a good point that I, I, I was mentioning earlier. I, I was thinking the same thing, you know. Um, in the next 10 days, are we going to see some fallout from all of the protests and these large groups of people and the large congregations? What are we going to see? Are we going to see anything? Or, I don't know, going, going into that. A lot of, it's a lot of young people that they interact with their families and their parents and their grandparents. Yeah. I mean, so... In St. Louis, in, in the city of St. Louis, just specifically, 70% um, of, of our cases have been in, in elder care facilities in the city of St. Louis. And those are you know, primarily in uh, lower socioeconomic parts of the city. Um, and you know, the, the county is a different, the county's different numbers. I don't know, I don't know the county's numbers, but um, I imagine that potentially a lot of these people might be protesting, might have service jobs that work and maybe work around some elderly people or whatever in the evening or do some things. Potentially there is a chance for spread because of maybe the other work that they do. Um, that's, that's a risk, I think, for sure, you know, um, or, you know, just coming back to family members. We'll see. I, I think we'll see what the numbers hold. I feel like a lot of what's baked in as far as people's comfort levels right now is that the spread isn't, isn't as bad right now for whatever reason is that we thought I, you know, I brought up those two anecdotal stories earlier. Um, if there weren't more cases from those hair, those hairstylists, I can't believe that a single person wasn't infected. Um, yeah. you know, the, the, the Ozark thing, 
doesn't really surprise me based upon a lot of the recent research that we've shared here over the last week or so that being outside and having short term, you know, contact, you know, most of the cases are, are for, for people that were indoors that were exposed for a long period of time. So, but the hairstylist, that, that one. That was a bit that, weird. You would have thought. And, and they are there. in a tight space. And I know, I don't know about where you are, Matt, in St. Louis, but like here right. in Washington, when they opened up a loud hairstylist, they can only work every other station. I, so I don't, they space. But we're still just cutting our own hair at my house, so I don't I don't know for sure. But I do know um, I do know that like a great clips is probably a, like on a fifteen minute model of like of haircuts. It's pretty. It's pretty. <laughs> yeah, but the people that work there are in there all day long. You're right. So and and they're they are being exposed over and over again. Well, it doesn't appear. Like, it doesn't appear they exposed each other. Like one hairstylist exposed the other hairstylist. So like they were both. How, how many people work there? Maybe is the question. Were there like twelve hairstylists, or were there? Maybe only two people work there. Right. I mean, yeah, I don't, yeah. yeah, I think a great clips is typically like a three man operation. It's pretty like usually pretty understaffed and, and you know, underwhelming. Like they're doing that. They're doing the phones and the service. They've actually gotten rid of the customer like service person that used to like check you in. They have a kiosk now. Um, I, you know, I haven't been to a great clips in a long time, but I, that was like quite a few years ago that they introduced a lot of that. Um, so I imagine that that they probably had good social distancing in place. Yeah. Um, every great clips I've ever been in has ever been has been pretty underwhelmingly staffed. Usually pretty big, high ceilings, you know, so a lot of air. Yeah. Um, but we our great clips are are maybe we're cheap. <laughs> we don't care about how we look <laughs> like you guys do in St. Louis, but ours are usually have a lot of people working at our great clips here. Yeah. Yeah, um, so Deborah was, was saying down because people are a bit leery about going out and and exposing themselves i don't know um yeah. imagine there's a ton of people that could use a haircut right now myself included so I've, I've probably been as conservative as anybody in terms of trying to uh social distance and stay out of of, of public places but i'm gonna have to break down and get a haircut here pretty soon yeah. Just like me. i i know a lot of people that that have gone in as soon as they opened. Uh, and I know my hairstylist contacted me and told me, hey, I'm open on this day. Let's get you on the books. I was like, yeah, please. All right, sounds good. And mm. most everybody I know, uh, female humans that I know, already have an appointment to get their hair done. And they've only been open for three days. So, um, I so, did see here, you guys, that Debbie is talking about, we had a person come to Tulsa for the protest and is now testing positive for COVID. So I would love a little bit more info about that, Debbie, is, you know, um, did they bring it with them? Did they catch it here? You know, if you have more info about that, that would be awesome. Yeah. Um, with, with those people being outside, it'll be interesting. Summertime, they're outside. Yeah. Um, some so, people wear a mask, yeah. some people weren't. I think it, it seems like masks really do play a, a role of, of reducing the spread. So one, one thing we're seeing in Missouri is, is we do more tests, we are getting more positives, but we're, but our but our hospitalizations and deaths per day are are still declining at this time from so even though we're seeing more cases, and I think so I think we saw like 105 cases uh, last time I looked was a couple days ago, which Pretty, pretty good amount. I mean, our state's small. It's something like New York where they're getting 20,000 cases a day, but um, on about 6,000, on about 6,000 tests. So it's still, it's still out there. Basically they're, they're thinking in Missouri, like double the number of cases that they catch per day. There's probably a thousand new cases per day out there, you know, over a 14 week incubation cycle, you know, till, till here, till here, there's probably 15 to 20,000 active cases at any, at any time in Missouri right now i would I, you know and then you know we're on the lower to middle of the scale so i think if you look at your kind of data you could probably see um you know what i would be looking for is not necessarily more positive tests it's more hospitalizations more more people passing away from this that's the real that's the real measure until there's until there's universal testing um 
I've mentioned this gadget before. This is something I've thought about investing for my staff, and it depends on the, the mood of the country. Is um, There's a tech company that's inventing a little iPhone widget that'll go on the bottom of a phone. About $55, you can do a saliva test on it. Like, I don't know if you lick it or what you do. What, you spit on it? Yeah, yeah. And, and it provides it can provide testing instantaneously. Um, I found it uh, a while back and I thought it was vaporware, but there's quite a bit of, there's quite a bit of research that's gone into this. Uh, it was originally designed as a uh, Zika tester uh, and they re they remodified it to, for COVID. And it appears that by August, this will be available for about $55 per unit. So I was, I was thinking at some point, you know, for, for customers, Five bucks, I love it. If it works. Are there any statistics in terms of like false reads, either false positives or false it's, negatives? It's just a, it's just like a beta wear device right now. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, I just have read a couple articles on it, but it, it gives me hope that there's going to be some technological solutions for this. Testing is still our way through this. Like I, I know we've all kind of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, think this is over, but I, I do think testing is going to provide a lot of peace of mind. If we can get daily tests to our staff towards the end of the summer for a dollar a day, you know, we're going to be like new. Everything, everything changes if, if we can get testing, but let's roll the clock back all the way back to, uh, I don't know, February and March where, you know, CDC was supposed to be geared up and they had all these tests and they sent them out and, they had to recall them all because about 20% of them would pr produce a false negative where somebody really had the virus and the test said that they didn't, which is really bad. <laughs> so <laughs> we don't need those. Let's get rid of those. And it took them, I don't know, a couple of months before them to come up with other tests. And then the CDC, you know, normally the CDC is very rigid in terms of controlling, you know, how tests are commissioned and who can do it. They basically said, to heck with it. We just need tests. Anybody out there who thinks they can come up with one, just put it on the market. There was a lot of tests out there that were really not very accurate. And, and a lot of these were wrong on the false positive side. That mm -hmm. if it said that you were sick, you didn't really know if you were or not. They'd yes. have to send you back for a second test to see if you got the same result or not. Certainly would hate to spend 55. I mean, I was thinking about deploying these to my every single employee that I have. Like it would be basically part of your your work uniform that you get and basically you have to take a picture of this to us every day that you're, you know, that you're negative for COVID. Like, but again, you're right. It's gotta be accurate. It's gotta be, it's gotta be reliable and it's gotta be, you know, it's gotta be affordable. And I think businesses are going to take the lead on, on getting our economy back to up, up on our foot. You know, I'm not going to talk anything bad about leadership. I think people have different opinions on what their governors did or what the top level leadership is. But I think, that businesses like ours have actually an opportunity to be the real leaders in this space of getting our economy back up and running. And that leadership could be something as simple as somehow providing some daily certification that your staff is safe. And then like right now we're doing that through questionnaires and through, through you know, temperature scans or other methods, but man, it would be impressive if we could roll out a, you know, a device and we could all get this in our businesses um, that's going to change the game and really provide some confidence in the marketplace. People will still will will be ready to go spend money at a restaurant if every if every server server and cook that day has been certified that they're that they they're COVID free, right? Um, is there these these tests which are supposed to be coming out in August? Is there any way to pre-order these? Is there what's the? I haven't looked at it in a couple of weeks, Tom. I, I will. I will say that that there was not last time I looked. It, you know, I thought it was vaporware at first, but they're they're confident that it's going to come out. It was it received ten million dollars in backing from um, from a major university. I want to say Stanford, but I I, I have to reread the article. Um, so it's it, it was it was real enough that some real money was put into it to kind of accelerate getting it to the finish line this summer. But then being able to make those in enough quantity to make it relevant, another thing. Right. I mean, God, I mean, you'd think you'd think they could sell 10 million of those things. You know, I think that you, you could. Yeah. You know, I, I would say, you know, 100 million. Yeah. I mean, like you're saying, like everybody if you're so product, I would get one for everybody in my company. Yeah. Yeah. That would be. The goal, I think, would be that every household would have one. You know, like that would be that would be a great goal, like you know, for something like this. But yeah, how quickly can you get it ramped up? 
And we're talking about just domestically here in the U.S. And I mean, the demand globally would just be off the charts. True. True. And I'm not allowed to a lot of comments here over here you guys i just wanted to point out um so marcia has a doctor friend that is saying that um his information that he's dealing with is about 30 percent false negative Ugh, that's a lousy number right there um leslie bought thermometers for all of her employees and every one of her employees sends a picture of their of their temperature each day and you know what i gotta say after having laura on the call what was it on day before yesterday tuesday like yeah i want to do whatever we can to kind of you know protect ourselves because you know she she made it seem like you know don't worry don't don't get too freaked out but you know changes are coming there yeah. uh leslie 1000 new cases today i saw what 16 states have a rise in cases they don't know how much of that has to do with testing so now um yeah marcia has spent money on that's true. I could, yeah. When we all, oh, ooh, that would be awesome. The, I'm guessing your mom's in the hospital, maybe. Oh no, probably just at home, elderly. But the hospitals, y'all. These poor people in the hospitals, not not getting, you know, visitors. Nobody being able to be with them. It would be great if we could get something for those people, just so they can go um, in. I know two different people who have family members in the hospital, and neither one of them can visit their family member. Yeah. I think I mean I think if they had some rapid testing is again, we're talking about testing still. It doesn't have to be this live test or whatever, but whatever whatever if we can get to the point where we can do rapid testing where you walk in some place and for a dollar you go into a hospital, okay, you you again you're you're gonna have to probably get to like ninety five percent accuracy to to really, you know, make people comfortable with testing as being the answer. Or I don't know what the number is. Tom, you're a statistics guy. Probably maybe needs to be higher than that. But it it could yeah. be the problem. The problem with the testing is, and we just like the pe people wired into the CDC right. that that I guess are, are are doing this as a as a profession. They believe there's going to be a lot of tests available through whatever you know the, the traditional tests, and I guess there's a number of varieties of those come the fall and when we're really going to need them, but. The facilities in which one can get tested is which is going to be the problem because most doctors' offices don't want that hassle, don't want that liability because somebody comes in, they test positive, and then they have to quarantine half their staff. I mean, it's they don't want to be, they don't want to do that. So the the the, the, the real gap that we have is 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 testing facilities and being able to get it to where it be self serve would be awesome. But I don't hear many of the, the, the people who are writing and talking about this every day, even mentioning that as something that's uh, in the consideration side. Well, just imagine, just imagine though, like if, if, if you can do saliva based tests, like through some iPhone or like an app or whatever, then it means that it could be done in other methods. You and I, and I think Liz probably does too, we do saliva based drug screens now. You could actually give your staff testing kits. It, it doesn't have to be an iPhone app. It just, I just firmly believe that businesses are the way forward through this. Our investment in testing and, and, and those sort of things are, are going to be one of the big ways that we get back open and get the economy really comfortable that, that you know, that our staff is safe. And, and you know, I, I mean, we're doing our best right now. And I think we're making really smart decisions and making good, you know, you know, best efforts. But, man, there's still a lot of uncertainty Um just every day. I mean, we don't know. There's stuff we just don't know yet. And I, I would like that knowledge that filling that gap would make the, make things a lot better. I don't know if I should be sharing this or not, but I will because it's real. Uh -huh. um, this is a legit company that, that I buy. We, the, uh, That's where we get our drug test. Yes. And yeah. they're selling COVID-19 rapid test cassettes. It is uh, supposedly only available to medical professional use, and they've got all kinds of things here in terms of, you know, who who's supposed to be getting these because they, oops, they are in short order. Or short is it? A, order. It's a finger prick test, though. It's not a saliva test, though, right? Um, ten minutes. Whole yeah, blood. Blood. Whole blood. Whole blood. Whole blood. Whole blood. Plasma. So yeah, you've got to you got to prick your finger. 
Yeah, I think that I, I am not going to ask my staff to do that yet. If they're, <laughs> but that that's that's on the way. That could be something that could help. I mean, you know, that seems like we're on the way with something like that. But you can't. You have to basically like submit, you know, your information and ask for pricing and. Yeah. It's not yet. It's not yet, Tom. But this is that's on the way. You get that to the point where that's a couple bucks a day. I think a restaurant that could fill its fill itself up with you know uh, more people because they feel comfortable. I mean, they're talking about doing some things in my town where they're talking about closing the, some of the street fronts on some of the busier streets to drive through traffic so the restaurants can place tables out in the street every night. I mean, I mean, people want to get back out and do stuff. People again, it, back to like we're circling back to like. The demand thing is people want to start spending their money again. They want to like they are tired of being cooped up. And then in St. Louis, two nights of 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 this unrest where they've had nine o'clock curfews, people are already flipping out because they can't go out at night because they're like, you, you know, they're literally so sick of being cooped up. They're like they're like people are losing it over a couple nights of this already. Um, so yeah, I think. Uh, they were already feeling, they were already feeling a little cooped up, and they're they're ready to get back and spend money and live their life again. And the consumer the consumer is flush with cash. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we shared a couple of days ago. The CEO of uh, Bank of America said that everybody with a bank account of five thousand dollars or less that bank with them, and one out of every two households in the country bank have some relationship with Bank of America. They have forty percent more money in the bank now than they did prior to COVID. So everybody's accumulating cash, not everybody, but the large majority of, of consumers in this country have more cash in the bank now than they did before this whole thing started. They just don't have any place to spend it. Yeah, man, if you haven't been going out to eat every month, I mean, so my family eats at home pretty much every night, right? Like we cook a lot, we do, we do a lot of healthy eating, things like that. But man, when we, when we got the first chance to order some Chinese food, we were like, dude, we spent like 150 bucks. We couldn't even eat it all, it was crazy. <laughs> Doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, so I, I'm just thinking about us, and we're like going through this menu. I'm like, I feel like that's how people are. They're like looking at the menu, like I gotta spend some of this. Like I am so bored. I think people are conditioned to go out and do things, and like, um, you know, this has felt very unnatural for people because they're used to being able to go do what they want, spend money, have services, do things for them, um, mow mow their lawns, clean their house. I mean, they're 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 done with this stuff. So there's. There, I think there's going to be an uptick in demand for our service. Now, there's a little bit of sticker shock with new customers. Like, I'm not a, I'm not always a fan of someone that's never had a cleaning service before. And, like, some of those calls where they're just like, that's so expensive. I'm like, well, okay. Like, I feel like we're reasonable, but I, I get your I get your concerns. I'm seeing more of those calls lately. Like, when I listen to our calls and be like, you know, I'm like, are we priced wrong for this environment? No, we should be charging more. But, like, we're not ready to do that yet. Um, we're seeing a lot more people that have never shopped for a cleaning service before all of a sudden looking for it. Have you guys seen any of that? A little bit more sticker shock or, or, or is it kind of back to normal? We were talking about leads a little bit before. Yeah. We haven't gotten that yet, but yeah, thanks for the heads up. <laughs> yeah. But we were talking about leads a little bit before Liz and I didn't kind of get to my point. I guess my point was, um, so May we were down dramatically. Um, normally we do about, uh, I actually broke the numbers down the other day. So we normally do about 220 web leads, which is not a quote. That's just, they've expressed some interest in our business. We convert yeah. a good, and, and then, and we sell online and via inside salespeople. So I kind of have two numbers. So normally we, normally we book about 32 recurring jobs per month for my inside salespeople and then 10 to 15 from our online booking. We sell about 45 Hi. new recurring customers every month. Um, so far this week, we've already sold 11 and we're only on Wednesday. So we're kind of back on back on track Hi. for a banner month for, for uh, some of the recurring sales. Now we're not selling much one times. We just don't have the capacity to put on uh, one times. And we're not even doing deep cleans with these recurrings. We're telling them we're going to catch them up over time because we don't have the time on our schedule to sell them a deep clean. We don't have, I don't have time to give somebody a $400 clean right now and take up a team's whole day cleaning a house. We're just, we're just telling them, Hey, you're going to get on recurring. It's not going to be perfect. We're going to get you caught up over time. I'm kind of doing Tom's method and it, it's working. It's working to fill our schedule and sell some new customers. Um, 
But again, and, and again, normally we sell about 35 one-time jobs via uh, our inside salespeople and then 35 uh, one-time jobs via our website through uh, Made Central. And uh, that that number I expect to be decimated for the immediate future. I just um, I just don't have the capacity to sell those as much as I'd like. So, um, and, and you know, a big thing with online decision-making for sales is how quick can they do it? And if they see it's two weeks out, they're not going to make the decision to book. They're going to look someplace else. So I'm definitely losing sales. Um, I'm definitely losing sales from that process. Need more people. Yeah, well, that recruiting thing uh, going. Yeah. Wait for the market to come back to us. I mean, it's going to be. It's. I, it, I believe it's really going to be a lot easier here in a couple of months. We just need to yeah. make it through Hold the. On. Yeah. I, posted, I, I posted it in your chat yesterday, our process, and our process is going great as far as, uh, as far as, uh, you know, not, we're not seeing them at all until they show up for their first day. Um, but did that you guys have a phone call or what you're doing? Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're posting jobs on, on two main sources right now. Facebook and Indeed are working well for us. We actually haven't posted on Craigslist since this kind of started. And maybe that's just personal preference. I just am just like, okay, we're focusing on these two. Um, we're getting about 50-50 applications from, from both. Indeed's been very helpful with us as far as, you know, um, you know, working with us as far as, you know, placement of our ads and doing some doing some work with that. But so we're, we're advertising. We get an application on Indeed or Facebook. Um, in Indeed, we actually just go through and just send them a, like a little thank you for, for their Indeed apply, and they have to take the next step. Uh, that automatically happens with Facebook. We actually put a bot in and it sends them a link to our full application. So then, then they do the full application. Uh, we review, we review the application. It has, it's a, it's a long form application. We do, we actually believe in a little bit more. I want them to put a little effort into the application. So we, we drop off a lot from those, those that are interested. I kind of call those leads, you know, we talk about with those web leads to like to quotes. Well, to a full application, there's a pretty good drop off. Um, maybe if we get 50 applications, maybe maybe 10 of those are going to turn into full or 50 like kind of interest on Indeed or Facebook. Maybe 10 of those turn into applications a day. We're reviewing those. There's assessments on there um, that are already kind of similar to um, kind of the Orion, but they're not as good as the Orion or things like that. But they're the personality tests. Are you so doing all of that through your applicant tracking system? Yeah. So that's all happening. And so we're making sure that they're a good candidate. Uh, if they are, then we're then we're sending them a link uh, through email to uh, schedule their own uh, interview. So then they schedule their interview. Uh, they self schedule through. We use Schedule Once, but we're actually moving to another software that actually will do all of that in, internally. I'm using. Uh, I'm moving to a new applicant tracking system where it's all going to be done internal to that, where we don't have to use parts and pieces in different software. Um, but all so right, wait, which one? Wait, don't move on. Which one? Because I know you use People Matter. I've used People Matter. If I need to switch, let me know. Uh, I'm switching to Paycor. The applicant tracking software for it is kind of expensive, um, but the other pieces aren't. So it has applicant tracking software. It has um, it has your HR software, your payroll, uh, and your learning software all in one platform. Um, it costs me about three hundred dollars more a month uh, than just doing payroll with Paycor to have all that, which is about three times what I was spending on people matter. So people matter is like $120 a month or something like that for, for one brand anyway. So, but we're, we're, we're moving on Paycor system looks pretty exceptional. We're, and we've used Paycor for a long time for payroll. So uh, again, so then they, they, they schedule their own interview uh, through schedule once. And uh, at that point uh, it, it, we have just like a standard, we're using Google meet. And what we did was we create a, a standard, a standing meeting. So that ID stays forever. So we keep that ID that it's always the same meeting room. So we just keep that open all day for people to pop into. Um, and, and so then they come to their, they come to their interview. We interview, we interview them via people matter, not we, we, people matter. we interview them via Google meet, um, you know, probably less than half the schedule show up just sort of like regular interviews. So, um, you know, we just continue our regular workflow. If they don't show up, the meeting's open and, you know, somebody's watching it, see if somebody, you know, shows up to the room. Um, after that, if it goes well, we send them one more assessment. So right now we're using the Orion. It doesn't have to be the Orion, but the Orions are on sale right now for 10 bucks. So we're doing the Orion. So 
that's a good that's a good value. So you know that would be a good maybe a good investment to try out the Orions right now. Um, and we're just doing that. It doesn't have to be the Orion. It just needs to be an extra step. I want them to show one more step of commitment before we make a job offer. So then they do the Orion. The assessment comes back, and they're not you know they're not in any high risk areas that we want to avoid. And even if they are, like. I, you know, without having met them in person, you know, and whatnot. The, but again, you, you know, I, I trust the Orion after having used it for a long time, but I also know that, know its limitations. So, um, you know, we're going to also go through all their work history and things like that before making a final decision. The Orion will just be one piece of it. But the bigger piece is, did they commit to taking that, you know, 30 minute test? Uh, the next thing is we would make them a job offer. Um, we'll make that job offer via, you know, our, our applicant tracking system, which is People Matter Now. It sends them out an offer letter with their pay rate, um, a link to our um, our job share system, which is our commission system, so they can learn more about that. Um, it has their out, you know, the hours that we expect them to work, and you know, just an, an, an offer letter. I think an offer letter is a good idea, so people kind of know what to expect from the job. It has some bullet points with some other expectations, and it, it outlines when when we expect. Um, them to reach back with us that offer, we, we have the offer uh, expire within three business days. So if we send them on a Friday, it doesn't expire Sunday, it expires three business days. By next Wednesday, that offer is expired. If they haven't reached back out to us and and done anything else, then we we rescind the offer it's off the table. Um, you know, at that point. We, we learned something really ye yesterday that uh, Heather Canning's doing, I think is really cool. She'll very quickly send them a letter, tell them that they're no longer a candidate because they aren't being responsive enough. Yeah. A number of them will crawl back and say, oh, my goodness, I didn't see that. I'm sorry. I really want the job. And she winds up hiring them. It turns out, you know, in a lot of cases, being a, being a good hire, that taking the job away from people makes, makes, makes them want it more. Yeah. I, I, and again, I, I don't think like leaving an offer open, oh, that we offered you that job a month ago. No, like we needed an answer. Like, so again, so we have a three day, three day, you know, says they need to get back with us. So we expect them to reply by phone. We clearly spell out that you need to call Heather, who is our HR person, call Heather. Um, and, and then they schedule their first day. Um, when that's scheduled and they call, Heather sends them out an offer packet through our applicant tracking system. Where they have all packet? An off a, a job an onboarding, packet. onboarding packet. So so they do their onboarding. We're expecting all of their onboarding to be done before the first day, and all of their learning done, all of their training. We have a we have a learn system to our our, our HR system uh, called People Matter Now. Uh, pay course soon since Liz has, which is going to have um, uh, all of the courseware that we've developed over the years and, and all the new things we've done with COVID and a lot of other links to Tom's training and some other things that they need to complete before that they can um, before they can start their first day. It all has to be done. And it all has to be completed before the first day. And if they don't do it, then we rescind the job offer. And that's again, clearly spelled out in the offer letter. So we're, we're getting a pretty high level of commitment. By the time they show up for the first day, they've done eight hours of work for us. And we pay them for that first eight hours of work that they do. If they show up, if they don't, you know, no big deal. Um, but they've committed to us. And then so we can look at them and be like, oh, we're going to put eight hours on your paycheck for all the work you've done up to this point. So that's our process. Thank you. Um, so Audra wants to know, Matt, um, how much does it cost to start to finish for your HR process? I'm not exactly sure what she's asking, but maybe you well, have an answer. assessments and all of the yeah. uh, things that you're doing along the way. So it costs about $4 per application in Indeed about three for, for Facebook. So, for, and that's just for their little simple applications on their site. So let's just say $4. It cost me $4 to get somebody to fill out Indeed's application. Um, again, about 20% about of those people uh, will fill out our full application. So uh, do some math on that, Tom. What is, what is that uh, per application? Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll answer for you tomorrow. Yeah, but so so uh, so five times that number would be uh, twenty dollars, basically roughly, to get it to get an applicant to apply. Um, of the of the applicants that we apply or that actually apply, um, of those probably we only uh, I would say twenty percent. So again, 
five times that number again, a hundred bucks to get uh, to get a job offer probably. Um, and then, you know, how many of them take it? 50%. So it's easily $200 just in, in cost of marketing for them up until you've, up until you've, you know, hired them. I would say about $200 to get somebody in the door, just roughly just thinking it through. But if you try to do it on the cheap and wind up having to hire three times as many people, I mean, you know, it's not about what you're charging per hire. It's what you're charging in aggregate over, right. over a period of time. We're like uh, into the five minute warning here. There's a couple of things that we need to, to, to get to. I see there's a question here about when the COVID course is gonna come back online. Um, we pretty much have the new e-learning platform ready to go live with, from a technical standpoint, but it struck us as we were pulling all that together that there's a couple of things that, that, that we need to think about before turning it on. One is there's a lot more functionality. And there's two roles. One role is for the student, which is similar to, to what we currently have. But we have this whole new role, which is the company administrator. Each company can have someone to sign up your, your, your team members and to manage their process through the, through the whole learning experience. And that's brand new. And Turning that on on a Friday and letting everybody go on that and try to figure it out over the weekend, I don't think anybody's going to be real happy with that. No. So we're going to be putting some training material together, some videos together over the weekend, and we're going to turn it on Monday at 10 o'clock Eastern time. And you know, hopefully the materials that we have will, 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 will help be a good start. But if people have questions and need support, you know, we'll have our full staff here to help with that throughout the week next week. We didn't want to run anybody's weekend. And um, y'all can blame me for that. Tom was all about, no, we said we're going to do it on Friday. We're going to do it on Friday. And I'm like, ah, I don't think so. We got to change. So, yeah, sorry that it's Monday. Y'all can send me your nasty grams. Don't blame Tom. He really wanted to do it. <laughs> I just wanted to, to follow up on Audrey's comment. I just did some quick math really quick and it cost me about $1,250 to get somebody hired, um, trained, drug screen and, and one week of training, which I don't know that that really makes them a solid employee, but it's about, about $1,250 between their cost and, and a manager's cost to work with them the whole time. And then all the costs up until then. So uh, roughly $1,250 to hire an employee. <laughs> But if you try to do it, are you happy you asked? Still, Audra, are you happy? Are you if happy you now? If you do that on the cheap, you're still going to spend most of that money, and you're going to be doing it many times over. Yeah. yeah. So this is one area. More yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to be going for the the lowest price. The lowest price approach to to this is not what you want to do. Yeah. All right, so Tom, you have to share what what we're going to do next week. But uh, Matt, while he's yep. pulling this up. Um, Leslie wanted to know if you're paying for those courses. So maybe you could give a quick answer while Tom pulls this up. <laughs> you're fast. So for, for, I'm going to have to defer since I'm, since I've been creating some of the, the courses, uh, I've gotten a little bit of a, a little bit of a break from Tom for helping on, on the creation. So yes, the answer is yes, we're paying, but not quite the same as everyone else. Cause we've been helping build them. So we're getting a little bit of a break for that. So but some of them he's paying for, like he is paying for the Orion and um, some of the other stuff that he's having to put through. But, but we're getting twelve hundred dollars. The actual fee for courses is insignificant. No, most of, most of that's just in a manager and their labor for five days, and I, and really our our training is two weeks. But I mean, I'm I'm just saying five days. Like they're not even really competent to even be producing revenue up until probably five days of training. They're probably you know out there cleaning, but it's not really revenue producing activity up until five days. So after five days, they're probably out with teams and they're they're out producing revenue. But um, yeah, I mean, that, it's it's expensive to hire people. There's no doubt you you should take and, your time and get it right. And and one more thing here. Real quick, like all businesses, they all argue about the right way to do this, right way to do that. But one thing that successful businesses don't really ever argue about is whether or not it makes good sense to spend money on a quality hire, which is what Leslie is saying. Best that money I can spend on quality hiring. 
That would be a smart business move. Smart business move, yay. Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. We're going we're gonna to switch up our format a little bit for these five o'clock Facebook Lives. We started off back, I guess, the middle of March. The focus was on COVID-19 and dealing with the pandemic and the crisis being created by that. And while that's still real and that's going to be with us for a long period of time, we're going to still talk about that, but we're going to broaden it up a little bit because there's other things that we need to be talking about as well. So starting Monday, we're going to be launching an agenda where on a week by week basis, we're going to tell you what we're going to be doing every day for that upcoming week. And we're going to be having more guests. We're going to have more focused topics where you'll know in advance. So, you know, you might, you might come here every day to find out what we're talking about. And if it's useful to you, you hang out. And if it's not useful to you, you don't, we're going to make it easier for you. So, if there's something we're doing next Wednesday that's really important to you, you can mark your calendar and make sure you're, you're here and are able to ask questions. Um, like I said, the topic is going to be broader than, than, than COVID-19. Um, we're going to have uh, more daily guests. We're going to have more, more what I would call structured education where, you know, we might have PowerPoint decks and materials and handouts and, and, and things to make it a more, more structured, more, trying to get more value in a short, short amount of time. And, and more, a more daily um, education. So that's structured. So like a, a presentation where you can learn something on, on the spot here. Um, also one, one, actually, I'm sorry, go ahead, Tom. I'll, I'll say my thing later. Well, just real quick, because we are in overtime uh, next week. This is what we're going to be doing. We're going to post this on Facebook tomorrow on, on, on the pages that, that we do these Facebook lives. Sean Day is going to be with us Monday and he's going to be sharing with us, uh, you know, pointers and tips and best practices for recruiting that we can use in our businesses. Tuesday, we're going to leave open for relevant current events and that's going to be an opportunity to catch up on PPP, coronavirus or whatever else is, is going on with, with, within the industry. Martha- Bring your questions on Tuesday. Questions, plenty of questions on yeah, Tuesday. Bring your questions. Yeah. We'll, we'll be taking questions every day, but Tuesday is definitely going to yeah. be having questions. Wednesday, Martha Weber is going to be with us, and she's going to be sharing with us techniques to build culture within your business during the reopening, coming back from coronavirus. Uh, Thursday, we're going to have a guest, a, a friend of Liz's, Paul Weber, and he's going to be speaking to how to help your employees do financial planning. And I think that we're seeing how important that's going to be uh, moving forward. And Friday, we're going to be doing on the spot. And some of you know what that is. Some of you don't. It's a rapid fire. Ask a question. Get answers. No, they don't. Explain what it is. The, the only people that know what on the spot is are the people that have gone through foundations. <laughs> well, I know what it is. So, okay. You, can yeah. you, 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 so like, you know. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Basically, basically, we'll have three people, and I'm going to be Liz, myself, and we'll have a special guest that you'll just have to wait until you get here to see who it is. And you'll ask a question, and each one of us will answer the question from our perspective, and there's a timer where there's one minute, and there's a clock that you'll see ticket, and we'll try to answer that question as thoroughly as we can, but when that minute is up, that person, that that you know, answer or get shut down and it goes to the next one. It's uh, a lot of information. It's a lot of fun too. What All else? Right. We, what so else we're we getting a lot, we're getting a lot of little love hearts here. People like the new format. I'm really glad that you guys like the, the new format. Um, it, we, we want to make sure that you guys know that uh, we thought a lot about this. We, and this is the conversation and how it started. Hey, you guys, I don't know. Do we have enough to talk about? Maybe we should cancel these. Maybe we don't need to be doing these anymore. But we had a lot of people say we love these calls. And we're like, well, maybe cut them down to half an hour. Are we going to get enough content in there? Well, maybe every other day. Yeah. So this is what we came up with. Same hour, five days a week, but with some content that we think you guys can look forward to so that you're not having to spend 
a ha uh, an hour every day waiting to see is this something I need or not? Um, yeah, Ernie, the lightning yeah, round. The lightning round. So we're way over time today. Sorry for that. We had a lot to cover. We'll have more information tomorrow on what the uh, new format's going to be, a little more detail. We think it's going to be good. And it's an iterative process. We'll tweak it as we go, but I think it's a good direction. Matt, you rock, as always. Thank you for your help. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt. You guys uh, be safe. Take care. We'll see you tomorrow at 5 Eastern. On Bye -bye. Friday. On Friday.